Hello and welcome to Chapter 10, Agriculture, Biotechnology, and the Future of Food. Basically, by the end of this video, you're going to want to have a better grasp of the agricultural system. And that does include genetically modified crops, feedlots, uh, feedlots excuse me, aquaculture, and things of that nature. First off, let's look at food production. So, current day, we are growing more food per person than ever before. Yet, there's still about a billion people worldwide each year that are left underfed and undernourished. So although we're progressing uh, in our food production and we're making more food than ever before, our population is still growing really, really quickly, and we're doing our best to feed these people, but maybe in the future we'll be able to do it a little better. At least that's the hope. Uh, in Chapter 9, and in my video prior to this one, uh, we touched on the Green Revolution, but uh, the book goes more in depth in Chapter 10 about the Green, Green Revolution, so let's just refresh and talk about it a little more. So basically, the Green Revolution is in the 1940s, and that's when industrial nations uh, brought industrial agriculture to developing nations. So there are good things and bad things about this. The good things are that yields increased, so these countries were better able to, uh, to feed their populations. A bad thing, however, is that uh, these countries were using now synthetic fertilizers and fossil fuel emissions went up, and so that uh, directly hurt the environment. Okay, so uh, let's now talk about monocultures. So monocultures we talked about in the last video as well. That's when I were to say grow an entire field of corn and only farm corn compared to farming nine different types of vegetables. So basically monoculture is uh, cutting biodiversity. So it's promoting the growth of one plant and not a lot of different ones. And basically seed banks, uh, which the book talks about, are the only thing keeping a lot of species alive because of this. Uh, and on the same note, biofuels, such as ethanol, are... Uh, being put into production and there's a lot being made because government is uh, enforcing that we put a lot of ethanol in our fuel now instead of just having petroleum. So basically, uh, as farmers were given incentives to grow more corn to make ethanol, people stopped growing other foods. And so even though the price of corn went down because there's so much corn being grown, there was a sh like an actual sharp uh, spike in uh, other vegetables and prices rose because farmers stopped growing other vegetables in favor of corn. All right, so next let's take a look at pests and pollinators. So uh, pesticides and insecticides have been used commonly for years and years, but there's a couple of problems. So first off, they can be very toxic. Also, over time they can become ineffective because just as uh, pests and organisms in general can adapt, pests are able to adapt to the insecticide or the pesticide and uh, it would no longer kill them off. So uh, there are other methods, however, to controlling pests, and one of those would be biocontrol, which also has its pros and cons. So basically, biocontrol is the institution of one species to rid of a pest, and this can backfire in the case of the cane toad, which is a very famous case, which I'm sure you're going to hear about in environmental science. So basically what happened is the cane toad was brought in to rid of a certain insect. However, the cane toad became an invasive species and completely took over the ecosystem, killing off other toads and other species that were completely unrelated. So basically what happens is that a species was brought in and there were consequences that no one had possibly thought could occur, and they occurred. So it's not always good. Uh, a more complicated approach is something known as integrated pest management, which has also become very popular. And this effectively uh, combines both. So it combines use of insecticides and pesticides, biocontrol, and then a lot of other things. So this has become uh, more widely used recently. Uh, and another important thing that we really need to address is pollinators. So think of uh, our little friend the honeybee down here. Even though we don't really love bees as insects because they kind of sting us and hurt, they are unbelievably important as pollinators. So basically we depend on insects to pollinate, especially the bee. But uh, something's happening to the honeybee um, colonies. So there's something going on known as colony collapse disorder, which is basically a mass dying off of all of our populations of honeybees. And so no one really knows why this is happening. There are a couple leads that scientists are following, but there really isn't that much information on why this is happening. We just know that it is happening. And so basically all these bees are dying off, and so we're going to need to find other synthetic ways to pollinate the plants, or we're going to need the bees to be able to somehow recover. And so this is a problem that we're dealing with that's really topical and very much pending and in the air. So uh, that'll be a common theme throughout environmental science because of that. Okay, so now let's take a look at basics of genetically modified crops. So uh, GM crops, as they're known, are becoming very, very widely used, and they're very important to understand for environmental science. 
So basically how it works is that DNA, known as recumbent DNA, is altered to have uh, more favorable traits. So take a look at this tomato down here. Obviously this is a fake image, but down here you can see what's supposed to be a normal tomato, and on the right here you can see a much plumper, huge, uh, ripened, uh, genetically modified tomato that you can see is being injected with what looks like a steroid or a chemical compound. And that's essentially what's happening, but in a less direct manner. And so this differs from selective breeding because it's essentially making the process entirely unnatural. So an example of that would be instead of uh, breeding two animals so that they could have certain traits, there's no breeding taking place. It's all uh, DNA transfers in a lab. And that's the main difference. So basically, uh, because of this, it's a very controversial topic, and there's an argument over whether GM crops should be used. There's a, both a scientific argument, and there's as well social, obviously. So scientifically, people uh, are concerned that maybe these could hurt humans and that we shouldn't be eating them because of all the chemicals we're putting into them and we're modifying the crop so it might not be healthy, as well as the harm it could do to the environment. And socially, uh, people are concerned because they're uh, worried that corporations could monopolize and monetize all of their food. Yet, most of these people seem to be unaware that much of their food that they eat is actually already genetically modified because it's widely used, as well as the fact that corporations mostly already run uh, most of the even ungenetically modified foods. However, uh, it's a very controversial topic and there are a lot of different sides to the issues that you should uh, be somewhat well versed on so you can argue either side. Next, let's take a look at feedlots and aquacultures. So a feedlot that's down here on the left is basically uh, our new modern way of raising livestock. Uh, so basically, as you can tell down here, this is cattle. The way that uh, we aim to do it is basically to squeeze as many cattle into a tiny area as we can in order to raise them, to slaughter them, to use their meat, to make food. So that's basically the chain of events and we want to do that as quickly and as cheaply as possible. Um, so even though that is a good thing that we're producing a lot of food, there are some negative effects obviously as well. Uh, feedlots like this can cause a lot of pollution such as uh, groundwater pollution and releasing tons of methane as a greenhouse gas. So now looking at aquacultures, an aquaculture is basically farming fish. So in these little nets here, there are essentially fish farms, little colonies of fish that are being uh, farmed and raised by uh, farmers. Uh, and just as there are pros and cons with uh, feedlots, there are pros and cons with aquacultures. So basically, uh, a pro is that it ensures that we don't overfish all of our oceans. By controlling the fish environment and making sure that they breed, uh, we'll always have fish. Uh, a con, however, is that disease can spread very, very easily. As you can imagine, um, in these little tiny nets, there are tons of fish. And so say one fish comes down with some kind of illness, all of the other fish could very, very easily catch that illness, and then all the fish in the farm could get sick really, really easily, completely wiping out the fish. So that's a big negative effect. All right, now let's take a look at sustainable agriculture. So it's basically what it sounds like. That's when you farm and nothing's depleted faster than it can reform. It's basically a very natural way of doing things. Uh, and this is becoming much more popular, actually. So while there's a rise in genetically modified crops, there's also a rise in sustainable agriculture, just on a much smaller scale. So, uh, you know, there are a lot of organic foods that now uh, consumers are demanding, like going to Whole Foods, Trader Joe's. Consumers are demanding organic foods. And also there's a lot of local farming. So, you know, farmers markets like down here on the right, uh, a lot of people in the community going direct to farmers and buying what they know are directly organic crops. Uh, and that's becoming very popular as well, which is nice. All right, conclusion. So basically modern agricultural practices have been producing food uh, faster than we ever have before and it's making it easier to feed our ever-growing population. However, there are some negative impacts which we did discuss. All right, so in chapter 11, uh, we're going to look at biodiversity and conservation biology. All right, see you next time.